Hello, everyone. Um, so I think that's kind of everyone that signed up kind of should be coming in just now. So um, welcome to the first uh, instalment of, uh, of 2021 of um, a series of monthly webinars from P4P um, called In Conversation With. So Happy New Year, Lang me your Lumrik, as they say. Um, and um, my name is Neil Young um, and I help coordinate the P4P project, at, which is managed by Sensecop. Um, as coordinator, I'm responsible for providing one-to-one -one support to social enterprises, uh, developing and running events such as these um, and training programmes and also developing um, new resources for the P4P website. Um, in the In Conversation With webinar series, we are joined by a range of individuals and organisations from across the social enterprise and wider uh, third and community sector who are successfully collaborating with others or who are supporting those who are collaborating. Um, it could be for a variety of different purposes, um, but it may include to achieve greater social impact, um, generate more income, develop new services or respond to uh, an emerging need, such as the needs which have emerged as a result of the pandemic. Um, in the In Conversation With webinar series, um, since September, so this is our fifth instalment, we've already been joined by Cooperative Development Scotland, uh, the Glasgow Arts Partnership, Community Resources Network Scotland, um, and we finished off 2020 speaking uh, with my colleagues, speaking with uh, Scottish Mediation. Um, and in today's webinar, um, I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Catherine McWilliam and Carleen Doherty from um, Development Trust Association Scotland. Um, DTA Scotland is an independent member-led organisation which aims to promote, support and represent development trusts in Scotland. And I was really surprised to find out that there was over 300 members, <laughs> which um, I wasn't, I didn't know about that. Um, I hadn't realised there were quite so many, actually. So um, I'll now let Catherine and Carleen uh, just briefly introduce themselves and speak about their background and uh, their current role. Good morning everybody, my name is Catherine McWilliam. I'm a Development and Communications Officer for DTA. So I've got two roles within the organisation. One is to support our members who are going through the Investing in Communities programme, which is a Scottish Government fund. And two is the Communications for DTA. So I'm the person behind our social media um, and various kind of publications and copy that we put out there. Um, I've worked for DTA for five and a half years now, um, which feels like a very long time. Um, but I absolutely love it. It's a great place to work. And as Neil said, we've got 300 odd members um, who all do different things. So no day's the same for us. And hand over to Carleen now. Hi, good morning. Um, so my name is Carleen Doherty. I have worked with DTAS for the past six months. So I joined at the start of the project that I'm going to tell you about later in the webinar. Um, my job is Vacant and Derelict Land Project Manager which means that I'm working with a specific set of groups, um, our members, who are tackling vacant and derelict sites. Um, and so I, I meet with them all the time and I'm an extra pair of hands to sort of unlock the barriers that are particularly present on these sites. Um, yeah. I just did that really typical thing. And actually, that is one of the first times I've ever done that in almost a year. <laughs> uh, so uh, Catherine and Carlin are going to be speaking about a new collaborative project, which uh, DTA Scotland is leading on alongside the Scottish Land Commission, uh, supporting communities, as Carlin said, in developing vacant and derelict land, which is really interesting. Um, so before their presentation, I'm going to provide you with a brief introduction to P4P. Um, the reason I'm doing this is in case you're joining today's webinar, it's a shameless punt about what we're doing and what kind of uh, what support we provide um, if you don't know about us uh, already. Um, there's then going to be a Q&A session um, following uh, Catherine and Carmen's presentation. Um, and uh, please note, 
and this will be one of a few times I'm going to say this, there is a, a Q&A function that you can use at any time. We actively encourage you to do this to make the webinar as interactive um, as uh, possible. And also, please note that a recording of today's webinar um, is going to be available later via our YouTube page. So, so we will we, we'll share that uh, link uh, through our social media kind of sites and usual YouTube channels. Um, so just bear with me, I'm going to get my kind of slides up. Okay. Uh, so the aim of P4P is to increase the long-term sustainability of the enterprising uh, third sector, um, including social enterprises. Um, one of the main ways that we do this is to support Scottish social enterprises to develop new partnerships uh, or consortia uh, with a view to then bidding for uh, jointly for procurement opportunities. Um, we do, however, support collaboration more generally um, and this has become, as, you, as you'd imagine, uh, particularly relevant due to COVID. There's certainly no shortage of work for us to do. I'll say that much. Um, core funding is provided by the Scottish Government through its social, uh, its 10 year social enterprise strategy. Um, we are managed by Social Enterprise Network Scotland, um, otherwise known as SENSCOT. Um, and we are governed through a partnership, including Saint Scott Cooperative Development Scotland um, and the Scottish uh, Community uh, Alliance. Um, so this slide summarises our kind of activities um, in terms of third sector support. So you can see there that our kind of main function is to provide one-to-one -one support services for social enterprises and other third sector organisations, which are funded through, through our Scottish Government funding. Um, these focus on providing organisations with the knowledge and skills required to tender for contracts um, and with developing new partnerships. So um, we provided some examples there of the kind of funded uh, support services that we provide, but it could include, for example, supporting you to draft a partnership agreement or a project plan, um, it, providing advice on partnership models or perhaps facilitating a collaboration development session. Um, we also run regular events and training sessions. And so sometimes these are funded like today, um, uh, but we also provide a range of bespoke charged um, training sessions. Um, and the P4P website um, is a great source of information on current and upcoming uh, tender opportunities um, and also partnership opportunities. Um, the website contains an extensive uh, resource database, which includes our flagship um, toolkits, guidance documents, templates and case studies, such as our collaboration toolkit, um, which is a step-by-step -step guide to developing a new partnership, um, and our 10-stage guide to procurement, um, and also a guide that we developed um, at the onset of the pandemic last year called Collaboration During a Crisis, which is all about the particular methods to developing new partnerships if you are perhaps um, you don't have as much time, um, such as in a crisis situation. Um, we also offer a range of specialist consultancy services in addition to our funded support. For example, uh, this includes our procurement health check service, which is an assessment and an evaluation of your uh, tender readiness. And you're then provided with a report which kind of sets out your strengths and areas for improvement. Um, so in addition to our work with social enterprises, we also work um, extensively with uh, partners in the public and private sector. In terms of the public sector, um, our aim is to engage in order to influence and shape procurement policy and legislation. Um, in terms of the private sector, we offer a social enterprise matching service to support private sector organizations with identifying and effectively onboarding social enterprise suppliers into their uh, supply chain. Um, 
so I always start our webinars uh, with a slide similar to this, um, and it helps provide a little bit of background in terms of the different ways or different models that you could develop a partnership or use. Um, whether you're tendering or applying for funding or not, or looking at just delivering activities together, um, you can generally categorize partnerships under the uh, headings of either formal or informal. Um, an informal partnership is best described as one um, that does not have any legal status. So this is best suited to shorter term projects uh, where there is no commercial relationship um, or perhaps you wish to test the concept or idea first before deciding to uh, formalize a partnership. Um, and a formal partnership, as you could guess, uh, is one that uh, introduces a legal relationship between the partner organizations. Um, so that could be, for example, setting up a new legal structure or uh, that's jointly owned um, or through a legally enforceable partnership agreement. Um, and reasons that you might decide to adopt a more formal partnership include that the partnership will, is intended to be long term. Um, you, you'd, you'd like to kind of um, create a new joint entity rather than relying on your existing brands. Um, you might want to limit your liability or risk um, and also to ensure joint ownership and decision making. Um, so partnerships for tendering um, or perhaps funding opportunities are a little bit different. So these are usually formal partnerships um, that introduce some kind of legal relationship between the partners. Um, and the model of these partnerships generally depends on whether there is a lead organization or not. Um, and if there's not, you could decide to form a new jointly owned body. Um, such as a cooperative. Right, um, I, so I'm now going to hand you over uh, to Catherine and, and Carleen. Um, I'll put myself on mute and um, remember to everyone that's kind of um, that's logged on today, uh, you can post questions at any time using the Q and A function, and I would actively encourage you to do so. Okay, so over to you. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, I'm hoping Coraline's going to share her screen because she's got the copy of the slides that we've pulled together. Brilliant. So, yeah, for those of you who don't know, um, Development Trust Association Scotland, or DTAS as I'm going to refer to it for the rest of this conversation, we are the member organisation for the Development Trust movement in Scotland, and we're a network that exists to support community-led organisations who are working to make sure that their communities are vibrant and sustainable places that people like to live in, to visit and to do business. And you can see from the slide, we have 306 members currently from Unston Shetland all the way down to Port Patrick in the South West. Port Patrick's a particular favourite of mine because that happens to be where I grew up. Our core aim is to support, strengthen and develop the Development Trust and Community Led Activity Network. And as well as our membership support offering, we also deliver the Community Ownership Support Service and Community Shares Scotland programmes, both of which we are funded to deliver through the Scottish Government, and both of which actually came about as a result of feedback from our membership. So the focus of today is partnership and collaboration, and hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll see that both are embedded in every aspect of who we are and what we do as an organisation. But what better way to tell you about that than through an example? I'm going to hand you over to Carleen now, who's going to tell you a bit more about the project that we deliver in partnership with the Scottish Land Commission. Hi, um, so I've extracted some key statistics and put them on the slide to help illustrate why this project that I'm going to speak about is important and then explain how it came about. So the area of vacant and derelict land measured across Scotland is more than 10,000 hectares. To help you visualise that, that's roughly an area two times the size of Dundee. It's a big area. And whilst there's been some really good work um, being done to reduce this over the years, sites are becoming derelict almost as often as they're being brought back into use, meaning that for much of the last decade, it's been two steps forward and one step back. 
So the sites are split into more than three and a half thousand sites. Um, and these come in all different shapes, sizes, locations, and conditions. The map on the right-hand side that you're seeing there um, is a map showing the location of all the sort of particularly problematic stuck sites. Um, we call them DUSTIES, which stands for Derelict Urban Sites, um, which have been that way since 2000 or earlier. And what you can hopefully see is that there is a high proportion of these sites in the central west of Scotland, but around Glasgow and over into Ayrshire, um, where there is a strong post-industrial legacy to contend with. Another aspect of how harmful these sites are is how often people encounter them. So almost a third of the population of Scotland live within 500 metres of a vacant derelict site, and this likelihood significantly increases in areas of greater deprivation. And this matters because what we all experience on a day-to-day -day basis um, when we leave our homes affects every aspect of our lives, meaning that these sites can be detrimental to the health, well-being and opportunities for people who live nearby and in the end exasperating inequalities. Um, so realising that a new approach was needed to both stop the flow of new sites becoming vacant and derelict and stimulate more action in tackling the new one and um, the existing ones, a uh, vacant and derelict land task force was set up in 2018. And through the work of the task force, a set of 13 recommendations were published last year. Recommendation 12 that you're seeing on the slide is all about tackling the legacy of sites which are currently on the register. Um, the recommendation is for a national program of green infant, um, sorry, a national program of investment for green infrastructure to bring derelict land and buildings back into use in ways that will help tackle the climate emergency. And the text at the bottom there says that the program should focus on urban green spaces, community-led regeneration, renewable energy, and low carbon housing. So on the back of this, DCAS and the Scottish Land Commission set up a partnership project to demonstrate delivery of the community-led regeneration stand, strand of the recommendation. So the project that's been set up aims to stimulate and learn about different models of community-led development so that this can learning can then be used to inform future policy and that in turn support increased action of this kind in the future. So the project's been running now for six months and we're now at the stage where I'm working with seven community-led organisations, the ones shown on the map. We've begun by developing plans for the site so I speak, and speaking to stakeholders and landowners and then looking at the feasibility of the plans. And hopefully over the two year project, we also aim to bring, uh, begin making these plans a reality. The condition of each site is very different and the vision each community has is also unique to their needs. But I'd say that they all definitely have one thing in common and that is that they're all approaching their projects collaboratively. So now I'm just going to give you a quick snapshot of what a couple of the groups have plans for and how they're embedding collaborative principles into their projects. If you do this, I'm only going to describe what a couple of the projects are doing, but a lot more of them are mentioned in the blog that Catherine and I um, recently wrote for P4P. So if you wanted to read more, you could find more info there. OK, so the community of Carluke have had a long-standing ambition to breathe new life into um, um, a derelict site within their town. It's a Category A listed wind power mill that's been on the buildings at risk register for some time and also features on the dusty map that I had on my first slide. So working collaboratively with various community interest groups, the Development Trust has now taken this ambitious project forward and they aim to, for it to become a heritage tourism and community facility that benefits the local community. So to do this, they're working in partnership with the local authority to share resources and, wild, and widen the potential funding partners that they can approach. They've also been involving a wide range of the community through, um, throughout the project and are speaking with the stakeholders to plan to use the facility once it's developed. The aim of doing all of this is, the, is that all these partnerships um, and conversations are essentially strengthening their project at every stage, reducing their risk and building evidence of the project's value meaning that it's more likely to go ahead and be successful once it's built. Another example is um, Castle Douglas Development Forum, who are taking forward one of the top local priorities from their community action plan. They want to bring a much loved and long-term empty hotel on their high street back into use. 
With this base, they want to address a lack of local further education and employment opportunities for young people by delivering a gap in the local tourism market. They plan to use the building to create a high-end food and drink training and experience facility, which fits really well with their status as a food and drink town. Um, the collaboration that they're adopting as part of the project is um, both at a local and um, strategic level. So at a local level, they're ensuring that the local supply chain is going to be used wherever possible and are beginning speaking with those um, organisations at the start of the project. They're also planning, um, that, so in terms of strategic partnerships, they're also planning on working with a private developer to split the building into two, split the building into two to deliver two complementary businesses, which means that each partner's risk is reduced and the project, the overall building will bring a wider range of tourism services to the town. They're also engaging with the regional college who will use the space to deliver some of their courses, building an evidence base for its value and also ensuring that the facility will meet the needs of the end use once it's built. So that's just a couple of snapshots specifically in the vacant and derelict land project. I'm going to hand back over to Catherine now who's going to talk about our members and collaboration more widely. Thank you, Carleen. So hopefully, as you'll see from Carleen's presentation, that the local level community led partnerships that we see um, are really about what helps our members get the job done. So these relationships can be with other third or public or private sector organisations, and they can be project based or for the lifetime of the organisation. Typically, these relationships can be with the likes of the local authority, community council and other small, smaller organisations operating in the same geographic area. Because of the way that development trusts are set up, they often act as umbrella support organisations, providing support to other smaller groups in the community to reach new audiences and apply for funding. We've seen a surge in this type of relationship as a result of COVID and the anchor role that many of our members have stepped up to play in their communities. And I suppose one of the questions now is how we maintain this momentum and also keep the, this role that communities have as, as the anchor going forward. At an organisational level, DTAS's partnerships are all about helping us to support our network. Carleen's project is one such example out of this, born out of a recognition that development trusts were well placed to tackle and transform the blight and vacant build that vacant buildings and derelict land can cause communities. The diagram on the slide just now demonstrates the tangled web that is our partnerships. And whilst it's largely unfollowable, I do hope that it illustrates that our partnerships come in all shapes and sizes. The orange shapes represent the various projects that DTAS is currently involved in, and the blue, the various stakeholders and partners that we collaborate with on a daily basis. I felt it was really important to put COVID in this diagram because it's fair to say that it's had an influence on absolutely everything that we do and continue to do going forward. So where next for DTAS and its collaboration? Um, I'm going to talk to you very, very briefly now about our Community Transport Solutions project. Um, that initially was one of the things we were going to talk to you about today, but we felt that the project just got started in December. Um, so what I think is I've, I've asked Neil if I can have the opportunity to come back and tell you a wee bit more about that further down the line. But in a nutshell, this particular project is a pilot project that's being delivered in partnership with Paths for All, Como UK, Energy Savings Trust and the Community Transport Association. And what we're looking to do is at a pilot stage, work with half a dozen DTAS members to look at implementing an umbrella sustainable community transport solution that will support bespoke individual community transport projects in geographic communities. We've, like I said, we've just got the, the project up and running, but it's, it's already um, got demonstrated so much interest from the membership and other organisations and partners in the community transport sphere. So we've got high hopes that that project will also bring some, some interest and results. So how, how do you get involved with DTAS and how can you find out a wee bit more? If you happen to live near any of our development trusts, please do get in touch with them directly. There's a whole list of them available on the DTAS website. You can sign up to the DTA Scotland's bi-monthly e-bulletin to find out more about what our members got up to and of course what DTAS is doing. And there's our, our website and various social media channels where we'll also keep you up to date with our activity and what our members are getting up to. 
Carly and I have both listed our contact details on the slide as well, because as I hope we have managed to illustrate over the course of this presentation, we're all about partnership and collaboration. So if you'd like to talk to us or you think that there's something that we should be getting involved with, then please do drop us a note and get in touch um, and we'd be like, delighted to hear from you. Thank you. There we go. Thanks for that. Uh, that was really interesting. I think it just also uh, highlights how varied um, development trusts are in terms of their aims and what they're kind of set up to do. Um, so we're now on to the kind of QA part of uh, this morning's session. So um, just as an explainer to everyone that's uh, logging on today, um, I'm biased, so I'm going to start off. Um, with a few questions uh, and then um, just to be fair I'll, I'll maybe let the audience have a go um, as well. So we've already had a couple questions in um, from those who are watching today. Uh, so just to start off, um, so question to either of you, um, what challenges do you think that the partnerships that are being set up for the vacant and derelict land project will face? And how do you think they could overcome them? So um, crystal ball here, as <laughs> you're six months in. So um, over to you. Um, I think that, that there's a, th a thing to do with timeline. So when there's um, very much thinking on the spot here, but where the, the a, a development trust who is working on behalf of the community so does a lot of things by committee and needs to get sign off sort of in ways that local authority does they need to go back to the people who they're acting on behalf of and um, is partnering with uh, say a private company or a local developer who can work who can make decisions much more rapidly and they aren't going back to grant funders and things like this there's a sort of clash of timelines and what they expect to be able to deliver in in a time frame and um, so that's I think being clear at the outset of the processes that each needs to go through and the stages that things need to be signed off at. Um, so that, that, that timeline is definitely a challenge. Um, I'm sure there are others as well. I suppose in collaboration with your community, you know, the great phrase of, um, I can't remember the phrase now, but you know, you can't, you can't please everyone all of the time. You're acting in the community's best interest, but it's a democratic process in terms of you're wanting to, you need to work from like a community action plan and figure out what people's on a, a wider scale, what um, the, the community, what the community aspires to um, and have it sort of written down so everyone agrees to, agrees to it. So I think yeah, you're not gonna please everyone all the time um, when you're working with a wide range of people and that can be a challenge to make sure everyone is listened to and taken account of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is exactly what Carleen said. It's it's people. People are often the biggest challenge in communities, as I'm sure everybody is aware of. It's whether it's whether it's managing expectation, dealing with snipers, dealing with those who are negative, trying to you know kind of affect behavioural change. Um, people can also be the the, the big, biggest asset. Um, so it's just about how you manage these relationships, and you know I think transparent dialogue and communication is, is critical for all, all of these projects. Okay, do you mean, do you find that kind of the case across, you know, your, all, all of your work then? Yeah, I'd say so. Okay, thank you. Um, I suppose as well, I mean, I don't know how um, long the, the project is going to be, or is there an end date? Um, but how, what do you think success um, will look like for you um, and how are you planning on monitoring I suppose that success and the project's outcomes? Yeah so the project is um, like a two-year set project that's what's been set up as and we hope to have case studies at the end of it um, that, that, that have learned about the process of the of, of communities bringing vacant and derelict sites back into use in the different models. So at the start of the project, um, the project in, in a collaborative fashion has um, 
has a, a sort of steering group, I suppose, and I met with each of the steering group to ask them what they thought project success would look like, because they're all interested in the project. They all work for different organisations, so I have a different viewpoint on it. So I initially sort of got those together so that I could scope the project and make sure that we were developing it in the right sort of trajectory. But looking forward, they're now the sort of success indicators that I'm sort of looking um, to make sure that we're taking off as part of the project. So some of those are you know, like stimulation of projects in more deprived areas. You know, one, one indicator of success is physical change on the ground because these sites aren't easy to um, turn around, especially in a two year window to you know, develop, sign off and do a capital project. That's a lot, a lot of, um, it's quite ambitious, I suppose. Um, what other indicators are there? So learning about this style of support and, um, oh well, there's a, there, yes, yeah, so there, there's a couple. Um, and I suppose how it's going to be monitored in, is that every you know quarter when I meet with my steering group, I'll be talking about how I'm progressing with each of those indicators. Again, just to come in and add my, my toppings worth there, I think a, a key indicator of success is, is increased confidence in communities um, to, to take on projects like this one. This this project is it's quite unique, it's quite innovative, and we're really hoping that the learning and the experiences of the communities involved in the pilot can then be applied to support and encourage communities across the scale to look to take on projects like these ones in the future. Yeah, the case studies that I mentioned, they're not just there so we can sort of inform future policy. We're hoping that they're going to be a resource that communities can go to and think, oh, yeah, there's a site like that. Oh, yeah, it's owned by that kind of, you know, landowner, like his local authority or, or otherwise. And yeah, that kind of solution would work for us. And they can use the sort of suite of case studies to maybe inspire that they could do that themselves and also have a more informed starting point. Um, because you know the case studies have spoken about the challenges and how they over how they would overcome. Are you finding that there's uh, more and more interest in development trusts that are not currently kind of heavily involved um, in the project? Yeah, well, so at the start of the project, I sent a shout out to our members to see who was interested, um, who had a site that they had in mind, um, and. There was a good response anyway, so around like 25, you know, just short of 10% of our members got back. And I was had to unfortunately prioritize who I was able to give focused support to um, over, over the period, but that's still a significant amount of people and more and more people are um, getting in touch. So speaking with their development officer um, within DTAS, and then if they've got a project on the horizon that they've got some sort of initial questions about, they'll then, you know, I'll, I'll speak to them to help them Get the ball rolling but it's um i think by this my the, the project being created people who were thinking about doing something in the future decided right now's the right time because we've got an extra pair of hands to help us with this we've got some support whereas it might have sat on the shelf as something they'd like to do and um, for a while if support hadn't been available I think that's a good point. I mean, we're finding that at P4P that we're maybe getting inquiries from perhaps from organisations that maybe wouldn't have before, um, perhaps due to the fact that um, the pandemic's maybe given them a bit more time to reflect. Yeah, um, I mean, we're seeing that across the board, actually. There's lots of, there has been a momentum established and, you know, the, the community response at a ground grassroots level to COVID has been staggering. Um, I mean, we've got a pipeline of something like 40 potential members just working at getting up and running at the moment, which is just absolutely fantastic. It's great to see that there is this, you know, drive of community spirit and community activity that's coming as a result of what's been quite a horrible time for everybody. Um, that one kind of uh, as, well, one one of the examples you provided, I found it kind of quite interesting. Um, so it was the Castle Douglas example. So um, you know you mentioned uh, supply chain. So I suppose um, how do you think that could work? How you know in terms of local supply chain? How do you think it could promote that and ensure that you know the money does stay perhaps locally with businesses? Well, I suppose the first thing that we're doing is setting up a um, 
like a focus group of local businesses and local suppliers to with the local businesses so other um you know the the pubs hotels the, these sorts of things in the town they're wanting to set up a focus group to talk about where the wider that business community thinks the gaps in the sector are to make sure that they're definitely addressing a gap with their business and not creating displacement of what services are already on offer so there's that side of it um, and through those conversations they'll also be speaking with local suppliers in the area there are a lot of food and drink um, suppliers they know this well because they're all local and um, because they also the development trust hosts a, um, like a food and drink market I think it used to be monthly or something like that so they already have the connections um, and I, I suppose it's about starting the conversations um, and, and seeing what can build from there. I'll probably be going away and looking at the P4P website uh, for the setting up partnership models to think if we're doing everything that we can at the early stages. Um, but it'll certainly be an open invitation to everyone who wants to um, have the conversation and see what grows from it, I think. Thank you. Um, so I think actually that ties in um, really nicely with one of the questions that we got in through the Q&A. Um, so uh, Barbara uh, from North Ayrshire um, has asked, uh, have you had any trusts involved in community wealth building? So um, I'd, I'd be really interested to hear more about that actually. Yeah, I mean, community wealth building is something that a large number of our members are, are interested in and kind of currently looking to find out more about. Um, at the moment, we're just at a, a signposting stage to, you know, putting people in touch with where we know there's community wealth building expertise and resource available. Um, not wanting to give anything away, we are looking at how we can embed community wealth building into the likes of our annual conference and, and the role for DTAS and kind of spreading the word there because there are absolutely, you know, the principles absolutely tie in with what we've been talking about today in terms of the network. So um, it's a kind of watch and brief for us at the moment, but we are absolutely looking to get involved with it. And we'd be keen to actually speak to people with expertise there as to how we can maybe get, communicate and get word out to the members about how they can find out more and get involved. And I suppose the, the term community wealth building has, um, has developed and it's getting used more and more. But in my mind, development trusts have been doing community wealth building since the start. Uh, it's, it is community wealth building, you know, um, if, 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 to be honest. Um, it, uh, and it also ties in with another question. So we're going to stay on the community wealth building uh, theme. Um, uh, Brian Connolly. Um, has asked uh, how can uh, DTAS embed the community wealth building principles across some of the projects? Because that depends how you define the principles, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Brian's actually just sent a, sent a chat to say that he's happy to pick up this conversation, which I think would actually be really good for us to be doing that. So yes, please, Brian, that would be great. <laughs> um, please drop me an email because I think absolutely we're, we're it's an area that is only going to grow. As you said, it's, it's the current buzzword. It's, it's everywhere at the moment. So, um, yeah, let's look at how we can can t can can make more of that indirect tie. Because as you've said, Neil, you know, it's something that our members have been doing for quite a long time. Um, but now the concept's kind of um, you know, very much out there and um, people are talking about it. So. Um, so I'll just kind of pick up some of the other questions. Firstly, an easy one. The slides, um, Lily asked whether the slides are going to be available after the webinar finishes. Yes. <laughs> happy happy to send those out. Um, any, uh, and I'm sure uh, my slides anyway, and I'm sure you guys would be happy uh, for me to send those out as well. Um, and as I said before the recording, it's going to be made available to the YouTube page. Um, so uh, Andrew uh, is asking, uh, is there a balance to be struck between informal partnerships early on and then perhaps looking at formal legal partnerships later? Um, so is there a kind of a fear that you might scare people away by automatically looking at a kind of a legal relationship? Yeah, definitely. Um, and there's also a kind of sense of territoriality, if that's even a word. I think when you when you start looking um, at, you know, partnerships and people's roles within them, they're, they're understandably as people can get a bit scared. So we what we 
I mean, our development officers will talk through specifics with with the members, and we're we're often a, a, a critical friend or a listening ear for a member just to kind of talk through a particular issue as, as it comes to them. But I mean, to give you an example of something you know that's, that's recently raised its head, we had a in one of the kind of a pockets where we've got quite a few members, we had one member that was looking to increase its area of benefit and there were other members around about that were thinking, well, hold on a minute, what's the impact of this for us? You know, we have our geographic areas of benefits of this bigger trust, you know, takes on, comes into our turf. What does that mean for us? How does that affect us? So part of our role that DTAS was to organise a, a, just a discussion, get everybody in the same place this was a Zoom room, um, and talk through, you know, what, what that meant. And the result of that conversation was that we thought an MOU made sense in that particular situation. So it wasn't legally binding, but there was a commitment from all involved that they would work together where it made sense and they weren't going to compete with each other. They were all about supporting, you know, the area that they come from. Um, but we've also seen in some situations, actually, you know, groups looking at you know, joint tender and opportunities in Glasgow, we had a group that created a formal partnership um, that recognised that they wanted to be able to tender for public sector um, contracts when they came through. And because of the, the, the nature of that particular relationship, they needed the more formal partnership to be recognised as an entity in their own right. So it's one of these kind of every situation is different, but there are thankfully there are lots of ways that we can encourage people to work together be it formal or informal but you're absolutely right going down the formal route initially scares everybody and just makes everything a bit more um yeah it's a bit more scary so our part of our job is to kind of alleviate those fears and talk through the the pros and the cons of each um, and help groups reach the the best outcome I think that actually sounds exactly what we do, to be honest. <laughs> we also do a lot of signposting to you guys, too. It's, like, um, it's, it's the, the, the tool that you mentioned at the start of the session, the, the um, collaboration a crisis one, has been absolutely fantastic. Oh, um, thank you very much for that. I'm really glad you said that. That's nice. We put a lot of work into that. Um, the uh, And I'm glad you mentioned the MOU word as well. So um, I would very much recommend that no matter if your partnership is informal or not, um, really, you know, have a think about just setting out in a very, you know, uh, basic agreement what you what you want to do, who's responsible for what, etc. Um, and that just makes things clear. Uh, there's a really good question in from Castle Bank Lanark um, asking uh, what defines vacant or derelict, and how long does it have to have been in this state? I think that's a fantastic question, actually. So there is, there, there isn't like a set definition that's sort of easily able to be found, but the Scottish Land Commission have, um, along with consultants, developed written a number of papers on sort of the, the state of what we know at the minute. And there are, it also gets broken down, not just into vacant, derelict, it also then gets broken down into urban and, and not urban, and the definitions are slightly different. There isn't, as far as I'm aware, there isn't a, um, like a set time period on how long, you know, we all use the term vacant and derelict, um, you, you know, you can legitimately use that term without um, it having been that way for more than six months or more than however many years. Um, with the, the where sites are classed as long-term vacant and derelict. That's the map that I showed you of the Dusty Register, um, which is available on the Scottish Land Commission's website. And that shows the ones that um, have been that way for a really long time, so since 2000 or earlier, so more than 20 years. And these are a set of, you know, the, they're the stuck sites that are a real focus because they, we need to do something about them because no one else is doing something about them. We all need to work together um, to, yeah, to make something happen, to make them not be lo lost resources for us. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not, not a very exact answer to your question. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that, that, I could kind of say that's a lawyer's answer, isn't it? Maybe, maybe it's I, maybe it's no. <laughs> yeah, um, well, the, there's uh, there, there's further um, com not confusion about it, but the vacant derelict land survey used to happen on an annual basis. The last one was completed in 2018, I believe, 
and um, within the vacant land survey, so there would be definitions that obviously the surveyor would need to apply to decide if something goes in the survey or, or not. Um, and where, um, so there's also a lot of missed sites with the register because they only took into account, um, I think it's 0.1 of a hectare or above. So something's um, really small. So a lot of the urban sites, they might be to us vacant or derelict when you walk past think what's that's been like that for a long time, but they wouldn't be picked up as part of the formal survey. Um, so there is a gap there in what we think is vacant and derelict as opposed to what um, is recorded as being vacant and derelict as well. Thanks for that. Um, I just want to put a shout out about the Dusty Register. That's a great name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it made me wonder whether it was actually a backronym because it just seems like it's almost like too much, is that too much of a coincidence to be like? <laughs> uh, so we've got another uh, question in from uh, Avon McBride. So um, she's talking about um, the launch of a manifesto from RTPI Scotland, um, calling on the Scottish government to provide support for communities to help shape where they live and to provide uh, funding to communities to achieve this via local place plans. Um, so the manifesto calls for 20 minute neighbourhoods, so I've, I've heard that term before. Um, so how does uh, that link actually into your own project, do you think? Um, it's quite interesting actually, so there, we already have a link, so I've been working a little bit with um, planning, well, PAS, so is it Planning Aid Scotland, um, who have recently been funded to trial some local place plans specifically with the view of sustainable transport, but working like me with a set number of communities to trial this out and see what can come of it. So um, there, there is a link in that if someone, a community was developing a local place plan and they identified set sites that were priorities for them in the future, they wanted to do something with, it was a blight on their community, they could highlight that in their local place plan. Um, and they could, that would then give um, sort of uh, sort of a justification to start the you know to get people to talking about that site and get a project sort of a plan together about what they might might want to use it for. Okay, um, Margaret uh, McLachlan is asking um, actually a question uh, or part of her questions. It's been in my head as you were kind of talking as well. Um, is there kind of has there been specific funding support to complete feasibility studies, for example, or kind of I suppose what are the funding kind of options for this anyway? Yeah, so there hasn't. So the the project funding is for sort of like my support rather than money support, um, and so I've been helping the communities get therefore get money in to do the feasibility studies. There's a whole range of um, different funders that they've gone to. So the Architectural Heritage Fund has been one, um, particularly for the structures which are either category A or B listed. Uh, sorry, excuse me. Um, the, who else? Let's keep on to. Um, the Scottish Land, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm looking up, I've got a wee map there of the groups that I'm supporting, jogs my memory. Um, so the Scottish Land Fund, so where a community is going, looking to purchase the land further down the line, the Scottish Land Fund can support um, development of that proposal through their stage one application process. And that's for feasibility, um, RIBA stage zero to sort of two. Um, so that's another sort of key funder if the building's going to be purchased. Other areas have gone um, to um, SOS and sort of regional um, organisations that have had some support that they can yeah, tap into. Um, but no, it's, it's not one, one solution for all of them. It's each finding their own path. Okay, so that's, I think that's a really good answer. Um, obviously, it does vary by region in terms of what funding or funders are available. Um, so we've got a question in, um, about a new development trust. It's from Donald Stewart um, in Bathgate. Um, one of his questions, I think, uh, is interesting. He's talking about um, a potential project of a derelict hotel, which could be developed as a kind of sheltered housing. Um, but it's currently in private hands. Um, 
and who are kind of seeking to sell it. So what do you think could be the best way forward? And um, should we as a local council, so I uh, presume he's from West Lothian Council, um, uh, should we as a local council um, compulsory purchase? So, I mean, lot, lots of lots of things within that. And I mean, what I would say, Donald, is I would encourage you to just get in touch with DTAS and we have a chat with us about the support that we can offer you. Um, I'm going to stick a website link in the chat for you, which I think would be quite useful. Um, and that's a link to the Community Ownership Support Service website. And what you'll see, um, if you go onto that website, there's a, a route map for a negotiated sale, which is all about um, community organisations looking to take on buildings from private landowners. Um, you can also get in touch with the Community Ownership Support Service, where we've got regional based advisors he'll be able to work with you and provide you with a bit more detail and support there. Um, the beauty of the cost advisors is they all work with, with you know, directly with local authorities. So they've, they've got contacts within the council. So might be able to offer you some expertise and guidance um, there as well. And that support is available to you, whether you are a member of DTAS or not. The Community Ownership Support Service will support any community organisation looking at the transfer of land or buildings or other physical assets. Um, if you're a, a new development trust, I think I came to Bathgate a few years ago now to talk to a group of community councillors who were looking at getting set up so I'm not sure if this is the same group but please get back in touch and find out about how how we can help um, I mean one of the things you'll have to do if you're looking at you know a, a project like this one is community consultation and build the not only the business case but the community support case for this this type of project so um, yeah get get in touch would be the key message um, from that question. I, yeah, I just wanted to say that I'd also be happy to to have a chat with you if you want you to drop me an email. Um, the details are on the DTAS website, specifically about the the hotel and the avenues that you could you could go down. Thanks for that. Um, so uh, we also had another question in, in terms of like historic buildings, um, which I'm sure is uh, so. This is coming through the chat. Um, so um, this is, I'm sure this is very relevant across Scotland. So, you know, some of the sites are historic buildings. Um, do you or your members have the support you need from uh, HES, Historic Environment Scotland, on this aspect? Um, and if not, obviously they're keen to provide advice and support around kind of support and sustainable reuse and community-led regeneration. So that's from Pauline. Uh, yeah, we actually, Hez very kindly came and did a webinar for us, um, I want to say last year, but 2020s kind of merged into one, so it could have been as long as um, 18 months ago. Um, we, we often signpost, signpost to Historic Environment Scotland, and I'd like to think that we do have quite a good relationship there, um, and we have found Hez very helpful in the past, as have, have many of our members, um, and I know that we have you know no hesitation in passing information on. Um, it might may well be time for us to revisit you know redoing that webinar and making it more kind of current and up to date so if that's something that you'd be interested in give me a shout okay so i think um, we have oh, sorry yeah go ahead oh, i was just going to say um <laughs> with regards to two examples that i gave both of them yeah i can see how they've got good links and just certainly for Luke development trust we're probably quite well known to some of your colleagues in historic environment scotland at the minute they're working quite closely with them um so yeah fingers crossed um, they'll help fund the, the the first phase of the build, of the build, the, the repair of the, the the windmill. So, yeah. Thanks for that. Um, I think we've got time for one last question. So um, we've got a question that's asking um, how does this partnership approach impact on the long term sustainability of the initiatives? Well, in terms of the two examples that I gave, certainly the, 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 the well, when we're talking about Carluke, the partnerships that they're developing with the local authority in terms of like sharing resources and um, I suppose the funding um, aspect allows things to be developed and more certainty that it's going to be developed. But the sharing of resources and um, the fact that the organisation, the, the development, the you know, the mill building once the facility, once it's developed, will be run by a community led organisation and the sharing of resources between the local authority and the community and a bunch of other stakeholders and the community um, to sort of help them build their community capacity to know what they're get, 
you know what they're getting involved in and the level of commitment over the the lifetime of the project so I think that that's being built into the partnerships just now like the value in the partnerships just now is going to mean that definitely the projects are going to be more likely to succeed in the future um, and with Castle Douglas definitely the but it's a big building inside and by splitting the building between a private developer to develop the bit that they want and the community to focus on the, the ground floor so the bit that they want um, it means that the project's much less you know it's much more manageable um, because there's they're essentially taking on less um, so the risk is less and it's absolutely it's going to be more likely to succeed in the future that so um, that is uh, all we have time for uh, in this session. Um, special thanks to Catherine and Carleen for um, agreeing to take part in today's session, as well as everyone that's uh, logging in. It's been um, it's been really nice chatting to you and lovely to see you. Um, check out the P4P website for kind of information on our resources, support services. Um, there's a contact us form there um, and you can also uh, contact us uh, by emailing info at p4p.org.uk um, so Catherine, Carlin, is there um, in terms of finding out more about the, the vacant and derelict land derelict, eh, sorry getting caught up the vacant and derelict land project is there a page on the details website around that there's not a specific page on the website. We've just got Carleen's email address. So please just get in touch with her directly. Um, and we do have various kind of networking opportunities through the project as well. Great. Um, and uh, again, a recording of today's session is going to be made available later uh, via our YouTube page. Um, and I'm happy to distribute the slides uh, following the event. So in terms of the next uh, webinar that we'll be running. Um, just keep your eyes peeled. We'll be announcing that over the next kind of uh, couple weeks. So, and then we'll upload that onto our, um, onto our websites and via social media. So thank you again to everyone um, and enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you later. Bye.